Well, thank you for taking the time. Are you dialing in from Los Angeles today? I am beaming down from Los Angeles. What year did you move to LA? I couldn't figure that out through my research. Um, actually, somebody who um, he's kind of like the gatekeeper of all the bands we're in, and he was asking me the same thing, and I can't quite remember. But I think it was 92. 92. So when you first moved here, did you gravitate towards the cat and the fiddle, or you moved as far away as possible from the cat and the fiddle? <laughs> um, I would always go there when there were soccer games on. So, yeah. yeah I, I, I find when you're the transplant from England that moves to LA, you, you either go, I'm only going to hang out with people from the old country, or I'm never going to see anyone ever again. And <laughs> For the people that hang out for the, the people from the old country, they play soccer at Robbie Williams' houses. Uh, did you ever do that? No, I was kind of envious about that. I, <laughs> I've got a friend who did, but I, I, don't, I don't know how you, what the, you know, how you get in with that, how, what the entry thing, you know, I don't know how you do that. I, I guess I'm, I'm, I love soccer, football, uh, but I've never been that good at it. So. Oh, so I'm, you know, I'm not sure if I would have made the cut really. But. Well, Rivers from Weezer made the Robbie Williams game for a while. So I mean, what? take that as you will that he was playing in that. Okay, well, maybe I would have made the cut. I don't know. But enough about Robbie Williams and all that stuff. We're here to talk about you, Kevin. And most people I interview don't have two or three prominent bands that we care about. Uh, the band that you have with your daughter, I'm calling the, the third band that people care about because you did tour and put out records on Cleopatra and all that. But we were connected to talk about Love and Rockets, tour dates and reissues. Uh, how many titles are coming out reissued on vinyl? Uh, don't ask me that question because I don't know. <laughs> no, um, well, hold on. <laughs> Let's go with like six or seven. Six or seven. Were these cases where the master tapes had to be tracked down or did everyone know where they were the whole time? Uh, I think they, I think they're in the beggars banquet vaults. And uh, so, yeah, I don't think there was... Uh, much trouble there. Hmm. I'm finding that some bands are waking up to the surprise of finding that their tapes were burned or foreclosed upon or that universal fire that happened 10, 12 years ago. And they go, oh, right. yeah. well, it's a good thing that our drummer always kept two copies of everything. Well, are you the <laughs> kind of musician who has everything from the olden days? Well, I did collect um, a lot of flyers and memorabilia for Bauhaus. <clears throat> I think maybe because that was kind of the first band that was successful. It's kind of like, you know, when you have your first kid, you know, you fill in the baby book and you you keep everything. And then the second kid, I hope my, I hope my second kid, Lola's not watching. Me. The second kid, you kind of like, I don't, you know, you kind of like drop the ball a bit. So it's kind of like that. Um, and now I've forgotten what the question was. Well, hmm. if you saved a lot of the stuff or you're the dependable band oh. member that they ask the questions to and where can we find the stuff? I probably am the more dependable out of everyone. Yeah, that is true. The, the stereotype is that the drummer in the early days drives the van. They're, they have no problems with the load ins and the load outs and they're the dependable person. Do you fit that mold as well in these, these bands? Um, <clears throat> I don't know if I'd go that far, but uh, you have reminded me something I was really impressed with. When Bauhaus played the Hacienda Club in Manchester, mm -hmm. uh, Peter Hook was loading our gear in. Like he was part, he was like really hands on. You know, he's, as I think you can just tell that he's a very salt of the earth down to earth. Oh, really, yeah. You know, lovely guy. And um, he was there. I was like, wow. I'm impressed, you know, so so maybe it goes for bass players as well. I would say Peter Hook holds the record for most indirect mentions in interviews that I do, where you'll ask about something and go, oh, yeah, and I remember that night because Peter Hook was there. 
you know, so interviewing Billy Corgan, well, Peter Hook's son is in Smashing Pumpkins. I asked the singer of the church, Steve Kilby, what's the last concert you went to see recently? Peter Hook. When I had the pleasure of interviewing Peter Hook, he was really nice. That was one of those where I went, I'm afraid of this guy. He's going to be really confrontational. No, it seems like no. everyone loves Peter Hook except New Order. <laughs> but, you know, back to the Kevin Haskins show right here. So you keep going tour, album tour, album reissue. Things have really not slowed down for you, COVID aside, in the last like eight years. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, you, yeah, been always keeping busy, you know. Yeah. Well, at what point did you start to notice that that was happening? Because in the olden days, quote unquote, the olden days, it would be you make the album. You tour on it for two or three years. You go away for a little bit, hope that there's a hit, hope they want you back. Whereas now you pretty much can go either by a house or Love and Rockets or a side project. You could do a reissue. You could do an anniversary. There's so many options of what you can do. And when did you start to notice that? Uh, maybe, um, I don't know. I guess if, well, when would have been the first time? Maybe like 2008, when we uh, first, so we did Bauhaus House Reunion 2000, uh, 1998, play Coachella about 2005, and then 2008, we regurgitated Love and Rockets. Not, that's not such a good word. Um, we um, kindled. Uh, and uh, so maybe that was the first time we're like, oh, yeah, we've got that other band we can play in as well. And people, like, actually, we've been really blown away by the amount of interest currently for Love and Rockets. It's, um, uh, you know, we're selling out theaters and pretty fast, and it's been amazing. So, it, you know, I feel eternally blessed and grateful, not only for having been in three critically claimed, claimed bands, but to still be doing this. And there's still people interested. And also there's a younger audience interested also, so. And, and then there's the fact that you've scored for video games and television, you have that career as well. So it really seems like it's all music all the time for Kevin Haskins. All music, all the time. <laughs> well, behind you, is that, a, is that your recording studio or more of a rehearsal piece? Uh, it's both. I have my drums here and my studio. Um, so, yeah, I'm actually, um, I always, I started like sampling on a cassette tape with turns on tail, like, you know, like Beatles films would be a favorite thing. And, you know, like old B movies and I would record little snippets of sound and then in the studio, I'd press play on the cassette and then, you know, just so that, the right moment and then I moved on to you know sampling and and I then I got into triggering things live so I'm playing the drums but I'll maybe trigger a vocal or or a weird drum sound or whatever and um I I it, it's something I really enjoy doing and so for this Love and Rocket store I've, I found about 50 percent of the old samples but I'm having to remake some of them and kind of re make new ones kind of you know there's all the kind of psychedelic way out sounds in yin and yang for example and mm -hmm. so i'm kind of so here i can press my drums then i can like go to the studio studio side of the room and uh, you know start creating uh, sampling and stuff like that so it's a good it's an all-round workspace this is a nerdy question related to all that. Does having to update some of the samples have to do with the click track not being used on the old stuff? Um, I'm, I'm not quite following your nerdy question. Okay. Uh, the average person does not talk about click tracks and samples in everyday conversation. But oh, okay. a lot of bands who would use samples and different pre-recorded patches and whatnot live Mm -hmm. they, when they recorded the original stuff, it wasn't a click. So it wasn't exactly precise. And now when they're playing live, things are coded 
or to click or something like that. Even if they are totally playing live, there's something in there that's pre-recorded. In your case, did you have to update stuff because the original stuff wasn't recorded digitally to current form? No, I mean, I'm using samples that have been going from hard drive to floppy disks to all these different formats of ways to save sound over the last 30 years. And so they're probably degraded a bit, some of them, but maybe that adds to the character of them. But um, no, I, it's not, it's just really, I just, you know, like to trigger these sounds and some are really important. So um, like there's one song that I've got to try and recreate uh, it's on my list today where I've got to try and create, recreate this sound. But um, I just, I think, because we don't run backing tracks, um, we don't really, well, Daniel doesn't really like being tied down, which I understand. Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of the human backing track, if you will, sure. if that makes sense. <laughs> the, the polar opposite of that is without naming names, there's one time a band from your generation, I'll just put it that way, even mm. though you were from Timeless Bands, a band from your generation, and I filmed one of their shows at Terminal 5, and I uploaded uh, the video of that to YouTube, and YouTube immediately gave me a ding of the copyright notice, which made me realize, oh, they're playing to the studio record. They're not just, <laughs> they're not oh. just playing the tracks, they're playing to the actual studio record oh, wow. with the <laughs> ISRC codes popping out. Oh, wow. That's interesting. <laughs> oh, that's not your problem. But, you know, the one gear question I have, because Love and Rockets and Bauhaus are totally different bands stylistically, dynamics wise, etc. Do you tour with the same drum kit and same drum tech when you go out with the two groups? Um, yes, basically. Yeah. I mean, I my previous drum tech couldn't do, you know, this, this Love and Rockets stuff. So I have a new chat come in uh but the same drum kit and everything yeah I'm, I'm using an all electronic kit now um and i i was a little nervous because you know like you know is it really going to cut it and but i've had some great reports from some very acclaimed record producers and drummers who are in the audience saying they were like thinking our sound guy our sound guy is brilliant he's like like you can't fault him and they were like oh my god your sound guy is brilliant and i said yeah i know it's brilliant but actually the drums were all electronic and all the effects were coming from the drum module and so and they were surprised you know like even like died in the wall purist drummers they were like that was an electronic so i think it works i agree and the last thing that i have to ask you is and this is intended to be a compliment you as somebody who's always working and you're still playing at top level and usually you know that a band is on the decline when the drummer's no longer hitting hard and is no longer great not the case for you how have you preserved yourself so well over the years um mainly vodka and mezcal <clears throat> just ba bathing drinking you know. pickling yourself in in fine spirits yeah. But yeah. all serious, this like vodka. Uh, besides vodka and mezcal, is it PT? Do you do a lot of stretching? Because I can't imagine when you were twenty, uh, you were thinking about warm ups. No, <laughs> no. Uh, so in all seriousness, uh, yeah, it, it now takes me. I start rehearsing maybe two and a half months before we, you know, come together as a band. Um, and um you know i hike every morning and do yoga and i do some weights uh it's just it's a lot of a stamina thing you know i i didn't really learn technique unfortunately and i'm starting to like like you know it's kind of more bashing away yeah that's my technique so i have to you know i have to be uh fit to keep uh but Love and Rockets is a little bit easier than Bauhaus. Bauhaus was a bit more full on. So there, there's a saving grace there. 
Got it. Well, I'm glad that you're staying super busy all these years later. You know, your music is what I listen to on the beach here on Long Island. I don't go for the laid back reggae and ska stuff. I say, let's go for the gothic people and the angry electronic people. So right. thank you for the many years of great beach music, Kevin. <laughs> you're very welcome. And looking forward to your next gig in New York. Thank you so much for your time and really looking forward to whatever's next from you. Thank you so much, and thanks uh, for taking the time to interview me. Outrocast. <laughs>